Well, good morning. We certainly have a lot of people here this morning. What a blessing it is, though, to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? We just thank the Lord for all this time and a place to be able to come and to worship and open our Bibles. As we start this morning, Roy, would you open us in a word of prayer, please, brother? Amen. If you would, please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 2 as we continue our study in this precious chapter and uh, as we get started here this morning. I'd like us, as we continue our study, particular in this section, in this area of the Bible, to keep a couple of things in mind. This section, as you realize, as we've talked about a little bit, deals with judgment. So it doesn't have the gospel. We're not looking so much at the gospel. We're looking at things from a sense of judgment. It's somewhat difficult, and a difficult area of Scripture to teach, and also for many to, to uh, actually to understand. And we're just going to really touch on that, as we have been, but it is very, very important. This is a very important area of Scripture. Uh, you know, as we've been doing our study, our Scripture reading this morning is going to begin in verse 11. If you'd like to uh, uh, go there with me in, in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, it says, as we're speaking of, of the Lord, it says, for, for, um, for there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, these, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the, the, the means while accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, behold, thou art called a Jew, and 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 um, and rested. Be uh, behold, thou art called a Jew, and resteth in the law, and maketh maketh thy boast of God, and knoweth His will, and approvest the things that are, are that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou art art a guide of the blind, a light to them which are in darkness an instructor of, of the foolishness, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest, a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest, a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that, that, that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, though breaking the law, dishonoreth thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written, For circumcision verily profit, verily profit, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the circumcision keepeth the righteous of the law, shall not the uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if, if it fulfills the law, judge thee? Who by, the, who by the letter of circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is, 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 that, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Father, we ask your blessing upon this time and upon this study here this morning. And Father, we just ask you to have an open heart and to rule and overrule in all that's said and done here this morning. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we see in our study thus far, the moral man is, you know, we saw how basically he's kind of self-condemned, but now we're going to see how he's also God-condemned. First, his, his own judgment is turned against him, as we saw a little bit last week. The expression, as we've seen throughout our study thus far, the things that have been mentioned, the sins that have been, been, been done, it's so easy for us to kind of overlook things in sin, isn't it? We can kind of think of things of uh, having to do with sin as, as real bad, somewhat bad, maybe not that bad. But we need to understand that God is a righteous God. And there is no such thing as any sin in Him whatsoever. So any sin at all is sin, and it's, it's contrary to, to what the Lord has to say about it. Therefore, we must understand that unlike us, or we can sometimes put, uh, we, we, can, we can make flexibilities and say this about this or that or sin. With God, there is no flexibility. Sin is sin in its truest and deepest form, no matter how minor it may be. 
as we talked about, we saw how it was with the what we might say the heathen or the or, or the uh, or the one that is really out, uh, really kind of a lost person out there. The kind of sins that they may have in the world. And that of the, quote, moral man that thinks that he is better than others and all. We've looked a little bit at that in our study. But it's a real challenge to really understand this, and it's important to understand it. Because he is with God, there is absolutely no unrighteousness at all. We have to understand that righteousness can have no fellowship with unrighteousness. None at all. And that's kind of the concept of what we're looking at here this morning. Once we can understand that, we can understand that truly we're guilty. And there's no way we can ever do anything in and of ourselves for ourselves. We are lost and without hope. And God does not compromise who He is. And in truth, that's what this whole study is about, is understanding how important it is that we understand that we need a Savior and how what sin really is and the seriousness of sin and not to wash it away as something that it's not. Yes, we see how that's going to be. There's four great principles of judgment, which concept, which we've seen in chapter 2, as we look at these things. First, it's according to truth. We looked at that last week. It's the first principle by which God is going to judge men. So what is truth? We said it last week. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? He says, I am the truth, right? I am the way, I'm the, I, I am the way, I am the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth. His word is truth. The other we look at in judgment is it's according to his works, according to our works as we look at that and how they're practiced. But this has to do with thought life and everything else in life, doesn't it? And we see that that's going to be judged as well. We also see, and we're going to pick up our study here, we looked at this a little bit last week, that what a wonderful thing, but God says he's no respecter of persons, and he is not. He's no respecter of persons. When God judges, there will be no partiality. As we talked about judgment, he is a just God. He's a holy God, and he's separated. And then he says, according to my gospel. A lot of people have trouble with that. Sounds like he's boasting. What's Paul is really saying? If you read the gospel, if you understand the gospel, the gospel tells you that there is a judgment. The gospel is quite clear that God is a judge, and he's a righteous judge, and he's going to judge righteousness versus unrighteousness, isn't he? So that's what it's talking about a little bit there. And you know, we talked also, and it's good to think about this, these things are really hard to understand. You may want to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 this morning, 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at a few verses in there this morning. First, we'll start with verse 14, 2 Peter 3, 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may, that, that, that ye may be found in him in peace, without spot and without blame. When he says that, what's he saying when he says, seeing, seeing that, you, that, that you look for such things? He's really talking about looking, and we'll look at that. We're going to continue on in just a minute here. Uh, but he's really talking about heaven, isn't he? He's talking about the, the new heaven and the new earth that's going to come in. If we go back in that same, in, in, in 2 Peter, now, now look in verse 9. Let, let's look at a couple of things here. This is kind of, I liked these verses I read. I didn't need all of them, but I thought, wow, this has so much to do with our study as well. Think about it. The first thing it says is the Lord is not slack. You know, it's easy to think the Lord is slack. We talked about that a little bit in our previous study too, didn't we? Because he doesn't bring instant judgment. I mean, let's face it, the cross. Should he not have judged the world right then? He doesn't. And he goes on to say, he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. So understand that what he's promised and what he says he's going to do, he's going to do, including judgment, as some men count slackness. But he, now he's going to give the reason. But is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. So why is he long suffering? Why is he slack as some of the world would count? It's for our benefit. And he goes and, and makes this other point, which is so important, that all should come to what? repentance. Come to repentance. It's an opportunity the Lord continues to give. It goes on to say in verse 9, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall meet with a fever and, with a fever and heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall, shall be dissolved, what matter of person ought ye ought to be all, um, I'm sorry, Seeing, seeing then that all these things shall, shall be dissolved. And what matter of person ye, ye, ye to be in, in all holy conversation and godliness? Conversation means basically conduct. 
looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of the Lord, where the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall mount away with a fever and heat. Now please notice in verse 13, neither we, nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now going back, we're going to pick up verse 14 again, reading it again. It's going to say, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in of, of, of him in peace, without spot and without blame. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking to them of these things, which are some things hard to, hard to be understood, which they, uh, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, re- wrestle. As, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye, therefore, beloved, seeing that ye know these things before, be aware, lest, lest ye also, being led away with the, ter- with the era of the wickedness, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. You see, my friends, the reality is a judgment's coming. A judgment's definitely going to be coming. People can deny it, keep looking on as they did in the days of Noah, and just think that, it, that it's, you know, every day is going to be like the next day. It's not. God is very, very uh, clear on this, and that's what he's telling us here. And, you know, some will say as we teach through this scripture, and we talked a little bit about that last week, which is real important, they'll say, you know, this, this tells us, yeah, there's works. You have to do works to be saved. We keep in mind, we're talking about judgment, God's righteousness, versus what we haven't gotten to yet, his grace. But we must first understand judgment. And we must also understand sin and the horribleness of sin, particularly from God's perspective. And to think that it cost nothing and it wasn't earned is foolishness. It was earned at Calvary, my friends. But you know the thing he earned at Calvary? He earned it all. When Jesus went to the cross and paid for our sins, he didn't pay for 99.9% of Bruce's sins. He paid for all of my sins. Everything was done. So you see, at that point, judgment is no longer in my life. In that sense, grace is. I am now a child of God. It doesn't mean I'm without sin, does it? But I should keep a short account there. But that is grace, and the other is judgment. Keeping those two separate is important when we understand that, and, and, and we know that that is what? It's without works, isn't it? It was a complete and finished work of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I can never lose my salvation, can I? I am not able to lose it. It was a gift of God from that point on. Remember again that Paul's not trying to show men how to be saved. He's trying to show men why they are literally lost. That's really what this is all about. So as we mentioned, we don't really see the gospel in this section. Paul seeks to this, literally knock the foundation out from underneath men that are trying to stand on something of their own. He's trying to knock that out completely, make you understand that there is nothing good in you at all. You have absolutely no right, and you have no goodness at all that you can ever earn fellowship with the Lord. So he tries to knock that out, and that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Kick away all those false things, that false foundation. So we understand that. Now in verse 11 it tells us, for, for he is no respecter of persons with God, going back to Romans chapter 2. You see, a lot of your ancient rabbis really taught and should try to show a partiality toward the Jews. And there is to some extent, there's a truth there. And they say that God will judge the Gentiles with one measure and the Jews with another. In this dispensation, that's false, isn't it? How are you saved? By grace. How are the Jews saved? By grace. There's only two types of people in our, in, our, in our dispensation, isn't there? You're either saved or lost. You aren't almost saved, and you're not almost lost. You're either saved or you are lost. You're lost in your sins, or you're saved completely. One of the two. That's the only two that there are. In the book of Romans, one of the primary themes, or one of the underlying themes, you might say, is just that. It is to understand how under, in this uh, dispensation, the, disp- the church, some call it the church age, some call it the dispensation of grace, but what it's all about is, is that there is only one way. Remember, what was in the Old Testament was types and shadows, wasn't it, of what was going to come. And what do we have in the New Testament? 
We have the fulfillment. We have, we, we have the revelation of that. We have it coming together. We have the clarity of it being clear. And that's what Paul is doing here, particularly with his Jewish brethren. Help them to understand how this is not contrary to the Old Testament, but rather is the fulfillment of what the Old Testament was, what they were taught. And that's what he's doing. Yes, the apostle goes on to show that all men, whether Jews or Gentiles, will be judged by the same standard. For the Jew, the law was written upon the pages of the Old Testament. But for the Gentiles who possessed neither the Moses, the, uh, neither Moses nor, nor Sinai, it was written on the tablets of their hearts. What do we call that? Conscience, don't we? So you see, men are born with an innate knowledge of, of good and evil, aren't they? Can that be changed? Absolutely. How many false religions out there, how many things have we seen that, that can teach things uh, with sexual immorality and, or immorality in their worship and also uh, even the, um, even the, uh, even the uh, sacrifices of children and things of that nature? Yes, it can be. But the basic thing is, is they are born with a, with a knowledge of that, but they can sear it, and we'll be looking at that a little bit. You know, it's a blessing and a profound truth which makes all men amiable to God's judgment, that deep down in every man's soul, God has, given, has engraved his holy law on their heart. Now, do I say that just because I think I, that's what I think? Or does the Word of God say that? We've seen a little bit of where the Word of God says it. Going back to chapter 2, for example, we read, I uh, said so we're in chapter 2, I meant we'll go to chapter 1 here in a minute. But anyway, um, no, I'm sorry, it is chapter 2 and verse 12. We see it says, For as many have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law, and as many as, as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when, for when, uh, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts that, 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 that mean while accusing or else excusing one another. You see, the law which the Gentile has was not the code, but it was conscience. It was not spelled out and codified as it, as it was with the Jews. But they did have the basic, basic moral concept which underlies the law. And as we saw there in verse uh, 15, it's literally written in their hearts. It says that that were written in, in the innate conscience of the soul, and to them the soul bear witness. People who have never heard God's word directly still have a moral compass, and they're accountable to that and to their conscience. But we must understand that conscience is intended to be a goad. You know, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a farmer by nature. You all know that. I know all about pigs and uh, what I give milk, cows and things like that. But anyway, they have goads. You know what a goad is? It's a stick with a sharp point. And what's it used for? To get their attention, to move them along, right? And there's, that's basically what we, how you should really see this when we look at conscience. It's not a guide. You know, how many times have we heard things like people will say, just let your conscience be your guide. You ever heard that before? Yeah. It's missing the function of, of the conscience. The conscience can be silent and even seared. What I just said, thinking about that, you see, we, as we have, first of all, realize that we're all sinners. We have that sin nature. And we can teach ourselves and learn on ourselves. And that's what happens when we get into these false religions and they do all of these things outside of that. It's contrary to really what, the, what, their, actual, um, what their actual conscience in its natural sense would understand. But they can do that. And you know, the more you walk away from the light, the more you reject the light, the further you go from the light, you can get to the point that there is no light. And then all things are possible, aren't they? We get to those kind of points. So conscience, let's keep in mind, is a guide. It's not a guide, but rather it, it's just a simple go to get our attention. What is our guide? It's the very Word of God, isn't it? And you and I, sitting in this room, we have no excuse. We're a little bit like the Jew. The Jew had all the oracles of God. The Gentiles didn't, per se, but we have this. We have the wonderful gospel itself, the Word of God in our homes, in our church, and all the blessings that we have of having it. Do you think God thinks we're a little bit more accountable to have those things? We sure are, aren't we? But what a blessing to have it, to learn that we can learn the things that we can learn. You see, the Holy Spirit seizes upon the conscience and brings the Word of God to bear with mighty power through the Word. You know, how often as a child of God can we think of a verse 
in a situation we're in. Or in a situation we're in, a verse comes to mind to help us through that situation. Isn't that a blessing? But how do you have the verse if you never learned the verse or never heard the verse? So it's important that we take, a, t- take that in mind. You know, in 1 Timothy 4, it says, uh, 4, 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirit and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Yes, the Word of God has a lot to say concerning this. Now we look at uh, God's raft on the unrighteous. This is the verse I was going to share with you. Remember, I want to share it again. We've already looked at this. But if we went back to verse 1 in Romans 1, in verse 18, we see this. God's going to make it clear they're without excuse, no matter who you are. It says, For the raft of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They are without excuse. Because that which may be, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You see, the problem is not that man does not know God. The Bible makes it very clear. We have an innate knowledge of God, as we just read. But what it does tell us is that he does know God. Man is born with an innate knowledge of God, and that they had chosen to refuse him, to refuse to glorify God. Therefore, mankind was without excuse. Now, in verse 16, it goes on to say, in that day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Christ Jesus, according to my gospel, we, what uh, I think is very clear here again is what we've been talking about here this morning, that there is a definite date of judgment, and it is a sure date. It's a reality. It's coming just as the flood did in Noah's day, when no one thought it would ever, it ever rain in the earth. They thought, nope, this can't happen. We can just keep on going the way we're going on. One day is going to be like another. Or at least God is so slack concerning things, we don't have anything to worry about. I think anybody that half a brain today can look around the world and see what's going on and say, well, you know, the Lord's got to be coming soon. He's got to be coming soon. But we don't know when, but we know it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. Yes, it's a fixed time, though we don't know what to, when that will be, but we know it's surely going to come. And men will stand before the all-knowing God, the day when God will, will judge. On that day, no man will be able to escape God's judgment by claiming ignorance of his written revelation. You're not going to be able to say, well, God, I, I just, no, nobody told me. You can't say that. We have been given the light that we've been given. We're going to be responsible. When I stand before God, it's going to be Bruce. It's not going to be Bruce and Pastor uh, Joe and Pastor Lapino, and I can say, that one, that one, yep, yep, they didn't do this, they didn't do that. No, nope, I can't do that, can I? God's going to look at Bruce and say, Bruce, what, what, you've had all of this, but now in my case, I'm not going to go before the judgment seat, am I? I mean, the, I mean, the great white throne. I am going to go before the judgment seat. In my case, it's going to have to do with rewards. What is or was, what, what, what is or, 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 or I don't have. But in the other case, it's going to be judgment. You know, the Bible talks about the book for those that are going to the great white throne. It's a book. You know what it talks about when it talks about the ones that are going before the judgment seat? It's, the term is books with an S on it. There's a lot in those books. It's really something to think about. Yes, the day, that day is sure. We know it's coming. What did I say? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Did I say it backwards? Okay, I, okay. Anyway, that's what I meant. The great white throne, where those that are lost are going to go, they're going to stand before a holy God. Remember, there is eternal life even for the lost ones. And hell is very real. And that's going to be a reality. A lot of people are like, well, when I die, I'm dead. Well, it's not like that. And for the others, we're going to be immediately in the presence of the Lord, aren't we? We look forward to that day. Yes, we see that. Yep, we see, according to my gospel, he says, knows that day of judgment was and is part of Paul's gospel. He did not shrink from declaring man's absolute accountability to God. Now in verse 17, he goes on to say, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest not, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more, that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And art, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light to them 
which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. We look at that, behold, thou art called a Jew and rest in the law. You see, they were boasting. They were proud. These Jewish men, they were proud about what they had, that they possessed the law. They were really something. Does the Bible have something to say about pride? Pretty serious, isn't it? And it goes before a fall too, doesn't it? We know how serious pride can be, and it's so easy to get into even in our, even in our circles. Humble. We should look at our Lord, the life He led. Look at Paul, the life he had. It doesn't mean weak. It means humble. It means having full, account of, full trust and accountability to the Lord, knowing our strength in all is in Him, not in us. There's nothing good in us. You see, the, the, the people of Paul's day, the Jews particularly, were extremely proud and confident in the fact that God had given them the laws and, and to their nation. They believed that this confirmed their status as a specially chosen people. And that's partially true because of what's been given. We're going to pick up that in, in chapter 3. And thus, they thought it actually ensured their salvation. Paul's going to set them straight on that. They're not saved because they're Jews. You go on and say, having a form of knowledge. All of the Jews should gratefully receive the law as a gift of God. Paul will show how mere possession of the law justifies no one when we consider that. Now looking at verse 21 and 22, it goes on to say in Romans 2, it says, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, doest thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? You see, the two big advantages the Jews really had was first the, ha- the first was just the very birth that they had of being born a Jew. That was a real blessing, wasn't it? Why was that a blessing? Well, we know from the Old Testament, we know that they are God's chosen people in that sense. And the big thing is, they had the advantage of the Hebrew Bible. They had the advantage of the oracles of God that had been given to them and their nation. They had all of that information. They were born into that aspect of it. It was all available to them. You and I today, we can look at and someone could call us accountable and say, you were born into a Christian family, you were born into a Christian nation, or you were born into a place where we can freely worship. You were born where you can have Bibles and you can be held accountable because we have all of these things there for us. It doesn't mean we can't reject it. Verse 23 says, Thou that makest thy boast of the law, thou breakest the law, law dishonoreth thou God. The fact is, once man rejects the truth of, of God in Jesus, he will fall for anything foolish and trust far more feeble and fanciful systems than what he rejected from God. The Jews set, set, set themselves up as teachers of others and did so with, with contempt and with pride often. They looked down on those around them that didn't know. They were actually scornful of them and of their ignorance of such things. Those that were less fortunate than themselves. My friends, let us realize when the Bible says that he is no respecter of persons, neither should we be in our, in our testimony. For the name of God is blas- bla- blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. For circumcision verily profit if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy, circumstances, my, my, thy circumcision is made of uncircumcision. You see, simply saying a rite or a ritual is basically means nothing. Insofar as it's just an outward expression, we need to understand that these are just outward expression. What really matters is the inward experience, the heart. You see, here's the problem when we look at this, what he's really saying. The circumcision, to be of any practical value, the Jew must keep the law. That's very important. And he must keep it perfectly. If you're going to be saved by circumcision, Mr. Jew, and you're going to tr- put all your trust in that, don't you understand that you have to keep the law perfectly? I mean, no sin at all? Can you do that? No, none of us can. You see, going back to the purpose of this, to bring us to repentance, to understand what it's all about. Now, here's the problem, as we see. As we talk about that's that's simply humanly impossible. To break the law is to render the right null and void. In Galatians 3, if you want to go to Galatians with me, we still have a little time here. 3, verse 21, it says, Is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily, righteousness should have been by the law. What's he saying there? Very simple. The law can't save you. It can't save you. If you think about it, you cannot cannot fulfill the law. But the Scriptures have concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe 
But before faith come, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster, for ye are the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many as for as, for as many of you for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Therefore is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not the uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? So Paul is not really saying here, just really, is not saying uh, about the divine appointment rituals, uh, uh, you know, about, 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 about those uh, uh, things that were appointed by God, those divine rituals that are there, there without value. What he is saying is the value is limited. It's limited by the condition of the heart. Christ is the schoolmaster and not the law. The law performs the office of the ancient instructors to lead us to, 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 the teacher, uh, to the teacher or the instructor. The teacher or instructor, of course, is Christ. And the way in which the law does this may be, it may be, by the, it may be as following. The whole law was designed to introduce Christ. The sacrifices and offering were designed as a shadow of the Messiah to help us again to understand him and to introduce him to the world. The moral law, the law of God, shows people their sin and danger, and thus leads them to a Savior, knowing in and of themselves there's truly no good thing, no way to keep the law. It condemns them, and thus prepares them to welcome the offering of a pardon through the Redeemer. The law teaches us the holiness of God and our inability to keep the law unto ourselves. Verse 28 and 29 now. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither, neither is the circumcision, which is outwardly in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. I want you to just think about the contrast of these two verses. Verse 28, we, we first see he's not a Jew. He says he's not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Look in verse, at verse 29, notice it says, he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, in verse 28. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not of the letter. We see that where? In verse 29. We see the contrast there. You know, we can look at this, and we can kind of see this illustrated, I think, very well, if we look at what happened when Nicodemus came to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you want to look at John chapter 3, I'd like to kind of finish this up. We're right at the end here, very close to the end here. Let's just look at this real quick. I love, these, I love this area of Scripture here as well. But it begins in verse uh, 3 and verse 1. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jew. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. We understand, first of all, Nicodemus represents uh, or understands that Jesus is from where? From God. He, under, he got that clear. And Jesus answers and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verily means in truth, or truly, truly, as he's saying. Pay attention, pay attention. Then Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answers, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But canst not tell whether it come and whether it goeth? So is every one that is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And notice Jesus' answer. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Now this is our Lord saying that. He's saying he shouldn't have known that. Going back when he called him a teacher, teacher of Israel. 
He was saying as such a teacher, he ought to have understood the doctrine. It was not new, but it was clearly taught in the Old Testament. A couple of, if you want to, we don't have time, a couple of quick ones are in, in Psalm 51. You can get with me after the service. Psalm 51, verse 10, and Psalm 51, 16 through 17, as well as Ezekiel in, uh, in, in chapter 11 and verse 19, and Ezekiel 36, 26. And there's far more than just those. That's just a few. See, we're far more prone to try to satisfy, and even in ourselves, oftentimes look, 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 look to the way we, who, what we can do in our own flesh, and not understand that it truly needs to be in the Spirit. We're born again. We are children of God. By God's grace, we have one of the Holy Spirit. We have that nature, and we are now part of the family, and we can take those things in, and the Lord will lead and guide and direct. It does not do away with the law, in a sense, because that inward thing, the things that God taught in the old, are also true in the new, but they're new in a different way. Remember, he's not a Jew who is one outwardly. This gives the sense of the, or the, or, or, of the original, but this, is a, this has to do with, with, with what is outside is outside and what is inside. What we look at on the outside. Not, not being born a Jew. It's being what? It's being born in, in, inwardly as a Jew. Very clearly. The question of all Jews, are all Jews saved? The answer is yes, in a sense. It says, he that is not a Jew, he's not a Jew if he's only born outwardly, though. To be a true Jew, you need to be born also inwardly. And they were in the Old Testament as well. Those that believe God. So we see that. So we want to remember this. There is a day of judgment coming. And that day sin will be judged. Jews or Gentiles will be judged by the same standard. No one can keep the law. Thus all are guilty. God did not hold back his righteous raft at Calvary. And we don't have time to go into that. But we should take the time. Maybe next week we'll start with that. Because it's so important to understand the tremendous price that's been paid for sin. It was paid in full. But to understand that as part of our study. With that, we're going to go ahead and close. Pastor, we're going to miss you while you and your wife are gone. Would you close us in a word of prayer, please, brother? Yes, sir.